Uncertainty comes with the job of any first responder, and for paramedics, that's no less true. But when Natalie Harris responded to the scene of a murder-suicide, she was unprepared for the trauma it would cause her or the spiral into PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, that it would create. She's now a leading advocate on the subject and has chronicled her experience in her book, Save My Life School, A First Responder's Mental Health Journey. And Natalie Harris joins us now for more. Welcome. Thank you. I've been looking forward to talking to you about the book, but also about David Beckham. Oh, geez. <laughs> you have a slight crush on David I Beckham, do. don't you? Oh, my goodness. He pops up through the book. He does. <laughs> if there's somebody that I have a crush on, it's definitely David Beckham. Well, I'm right there with you. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, I want to read something from your book. Sure. And you write, first responders see things they should never see. Sights, sounds, and smells stay with them long past the high they feel after a call well done. For me, my inability to cope with some very stressful calls wasn't an overnight change, but for some, it is. Mm -hmm. I feel a lot of work-related depression was cumulative, and over the years, I successfully masked it with alcohol. Mm -hmm. But sadly, I inevitably got that big, bad call that pushed me over the edge. What happened during that big bad call? Well, we were called um, to a hotel that we were actually close by, and the call details came in that there was multiple, um, we call it VSA or vital signs absent patients there, but we didn't know the cause, we didn't know how many patients for sure. So when we got there, um, there were already some uh, crews on scene and we my patient was Mark Dobson there were two obviously dead patients in the room already that were uh, so it was a crime scene and so once I got my patient onto the stretcher um, we did it we thought maybe he had been assaulted because he had a lot of um, wounds as well mm -hmm. and he started talking and by the time we had brought him into the back of the ambulance we put two and two together and we could tell that he was the murderer. So on the route to the hospital, uh, he was charged with two counts of homicide and that was when it began. I was starting an IV on him while that was happening. What began? That's when my view of the world changed. I was very, uh, I mean, I'd done so many calls over the years, like 11 years as a paramedic and, and then an advanced care paramedic and I'd seen gruesome things and I was able to cope with them. But all of a sudden, things changed when I was looking into the eyes of someone that could do that to another human being. So again, I didn't know all the call details at that time, but it was probably one of the most shocking things to have to deal with in my career. Is that what you mean when you say moral injury? Yeah, so moral injury, and I didn't know what that was at first mm -hmm. either. I learned that treating Mark Dobson changed my whole perspective on the world. I saw it as dark. I, I couldn't see the happiness in um, you know, being a paramedic as much anymore because it kind of made me very worried about, well, what calls am I going to now? Am I going to see someone that could do this again? And you know, accidents are one thing, but this was a very well planned out satanic cult murder. And it just, it, it challenged my faith in humanity. Yeah. So. Did your family or friends see a difference in you? Oh, for sure. So over the next two years before I had to testify, mm -hmm. I started to isolate. I, I started to have nightmares, night terrors. My daughter and my son would wake up from hearing me just scream. Uh, I started sleepwalking mm -hmm. and <clears throat> trying to numb my darkness that I saw with alcohol and prescription drugs. At the time, you didn't know that you were dealing with three different illnesses. Correct. Um, so how did, the, how did you find out what was happening with you? So growing up, I know that I, I now I know, I battled depression for mm -hmm. sure. There were signs as I look back and as I was writing the book, I could see that um, that wasn't a new thing, mm -hmm. uh, but anxiety was something that I never had to deal with before. And after uh, the call, and especially after the, um, when I had to testify two years later, anxiety was something that was very prevalent in my mostly home life. It was different when I would go to work, I was able to focus and concentrate probably because it was, um, you know, I knew my directives and whatever, but in, in my heart, when I got home, it, Things would build up because of the unknown of my job. 
on your job, you saw a lot of difficult things that mm -hmm. a lot of us don't have to, and mm -hmm. a lot of first responders do. Do you think that we're all vulnerable to spiraling downward the way you did? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and that's so much part of what I what I advocate for is this: we're human. It doesn't matter what uniform, what dress, what suit. It, Deep down, we're human beings, and um, yes, first responders and military, and we're exposed to trauma on a daily basis, and sometimes multiple traumatic calls in one day, and that's rare, and that's not normal, but people can be exposed to one traumatic call and still have the same reaction. When did you realize that there was something terribly wrong with what was, what, what was happening with you? Uh, so in 2014, I had to go back and testify and see Mark Dobson again. And I was prepared, and the Crown Attorney prepares you for what you are going to go through, but I wasn't prepared for seeing him again and having all of the call rushed back to me. And, and you write that you had to actually look at him. Yes, so I didn't want to look at him. That was my plan. And the, when I got on stand, because I was so little and he was kind of off to my right side behind a piece of bulletproof glass, the, um, the attorney said, please stand up and, and move over to your right. And by doing so, so that Mark Dobson could see me, so to make sure I looked at him. And then it was like I was outside of my body and the whole call, like I said, rushed back. Um, that night when I went home, I also that day had to go to a memorial for a friend who had just died by suicide, who was also a first responder. And that night I overdosed for the second time, so. What was it like the first time you were hospitalized? Well, I was hospitalized um, a few years before that. Mm -hmm. And that was, again, another overdose. And looking back now, I see that so many symptoms of my PTSD, or some, we actually call it PTSI now sometimes, it's post-traumatic stress injury. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, I was really sensitive to noise. It sounds really funny, there was a tractor that drove around my, my house every day, and my family would be like, why is that bothering you so much? And I didn't know, and, and looking back now, I couldn't cope with the extra sound sensitivities. Or the photocopier. And the photocopier, <laughs> yes. Like, it's such a little thing, but yeah. to me, it was just like such a prominent uh, sensation all of a sudden that I couldn't manage. And Did you find out anxiety. why that bothered you so much? It's just another symptom of, mm -hmm. so with PTSI, um, hypervigilance and different sensitivities, like your, the physiology of our brain actually changes. And for me, the sound was a really big one for me. Well, you end up attending what you cheekily call Save My Life School. Right. Uh, what was that? Save My Life School started as an outpatient program at my hospital in my town. And it was Monday to Friday, and we, all day, and we learned so much about feelings and how it was okay to feel them. We learned life skills that I'd never even known before. Such as? Like how to, do, how to deal with anxiety, how it was okay um, to play the tape to the end. Mm -hmm. I was more of a person that would react spontaneously to uncomfortable feelings that I had. But if I played the tape to the end, I could see the consequences to my actions that I never really thought of before. Mm -hmm. And then I developed a collection of friends that uh, understood what I was going through. And after you left the hospital, your life didn't go back to what it was before. What changes did you have to cope with? So when I went back, um, I had an overdose, a very serious suicide attempt while I was in the first portion of Save My Life School. And luckily my family and my friends uh, initiated the um, the process for me to go away to rehab in, at Homewood in Guelph. Mm -hmm. So it was a horrible time. I didn't trust myself alone. I didn't understand how I could possibly have had such delusional thinking to believe that this was the right choice for me, was to um, take my life. You know, I had two kids and I needed to, uh, so I stayed with my friend for quite some time and, mm -hmm. and she watched me basically and I had to stop drinking. Um, I went through a lot of withdrawal, so. You write about your friend, A.B. Mm -hmm. um, I have an older sister and we're qu quite close, right. but I don't think my sister would do half the things right. that A.B. Um, did for you. Yeah. What did that friendship mean to you? Everything, she saved my life. Uh, she really, she took me into her home, you know, and made sure she was basically like a mothering influence for me. And mm -hmm. 
some people looked at that as too harsh and, you know, Natalie, you're an adult and I needed it. That's what I needed. I, I didn't know how to cope properly. I still hadn't gone through rehab. I still was just feeling like I was learning life skills. And she was there to distract me from hard times, you know, and have the laughs that we needed, mm -hmm. but to physically watch me and make sure and that I was And she also controlled okay. your finances? She or? controlled my finances, yeah. um, my Twitter and yeah. my Facebook, and all willingly because uh, I also knew she was really good with finances, so <laughs> well, it was good. What led to the decision for you to go to rehab? So I was actually made while I was unconscious. So my family, um, I- This is after the third- After the third, yeah, after mm -hmm. the suicide attempt, mm -hmm. they just got the process rolling. And mm -hmm. um, my son also was, um, I was investigated by Children's Aid Society and I wasn't allowed to see my son. That must uh, have been gut-wrenching. It was horrible. I, it was. It was an eye opener and that was still a part of my life where I was in denial that I could be the person under that watchful eye of mm -hmm. CAS. Mm -hmm. But everything kind of all coming together was, Natalie, you need to go away and get mm -hmm. better or will you ever be able to see your son on, you know, on your own and will you be alive? You write about your relationship with your daughter as well mm -hmm. and you say, um, I wish I had taught her rather than tricked her. Right. What did you mean by that? That's so big. So growing up and, and then into my career, as I started to feel the depression, I would hide and I would isolate and I didn't want to scare her. Mm -hmm. So, but unfortunately, what I didn't know was our kids pick up on our energy and our senses. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage her to talk to me, but I wasn't practicing what I was preaching. So when I learned that if I sat down and actually explained to her what emotions I was having, it took the anxiety away from her. So she didn't have to worry. I'm like, you know, I'm having a sad day. And then she would know instead of tippy-toeing on eggshells and wondering, what's my mom going to do today? So I wish I had taught her before. And it probably helped you as well mm -hmm. because maybe you didn't feel like you had to put this facade on. You Absolutely. could just be where you were at yes. that moment. And not have to worry about what my kids were thinking. Mm -hmm. You started a blog? Yeah. Why did you start? Uh, that was encouraged by AB mm -hmm. and uh, another family member. Were you worried at all Absolutely. about what people... Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I... I remember writing the first one, mm -hmm. and that was the very beginning of, of Save My Life School. Uh, I felt very vulnerable, and I regretted it at first, mm -hmm. but then people started reaching out to me and saying thank you, that mm -hmm. it was a voice that they hadn't found yet, and they could relate, and so it just kind of snowballed, and then Clara Hughes saw it on Twitter and started to retweet it as well. And, and she wrote your foreword? Yeah, she wrote my foreword and mm -hmm. she's amazing. She's such a huge inspiration. When I saw her able to talk with, a, with her campaign with Bell Let's Talk, it, it made it so I could see that strong woman could, then maybe I could be that too. You say you felt vulnerable when you started the blog and mm -hmm. you, maybe that made you a bit hesitant to do mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think there was also a bit of like stigma that you were worried oh, about? Oh, absolutely. So self-stigmatization is one of the worst things that we do with pay, uh, when we have mental illness. Mm -hmm. And we make it worse than it is, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Of course, there were some people that, I mean, you can't please everyone. But generally speaking, the positive side of opening up through the blog was everything. There's a picture up there and your t-shirt says something. What does it say? It says, I have depression. So yeah, in one of the early blog posts, I, I, I kind of explain what it feels like when I'm at the grocery store and I say, you know, I really wish people would just share if they were feeling like I was that day. And then, uh, but ha ha, nobody wears an I have depression shirt. And then as I was getting healthier, I'm like, ah, you know what? It was the final day of the first portion of Save My Life School. Mm -hmm. And I made that shirt and I'm like, I'm going to just wear it. And uh, it was received really well. People by were people. asking you questions. People and, were asking and, and sharing. Sharing, like yeah. perfect strangers, you know, would come up and they would chat about what their treatment plan, plan yeah. was. It's interesting what we create in right. our head. Um, I want to go back to your time in rehab. What happened at Homewood uh, that was finally the breakthrough that you mm. needed? And that, you know, it took several, several weeks. I really was so negative and so doubtful that I could ever, number one, be in recovery with my addiction, mm -hmm. but to learn how to see life in a positive way. And back home, I had a tragedy. Um, uh, my daughter got sick and I was still so sick that I couldn't leave Guelph and go home. 
And the combination of that and not being able to see my son unless there was uh, supervision just literally crumbled me. And it's funny, the day before, my one of my friends in rehab, we were still so negative that we were Googling how long it would take for alcohol to metabolize in our body so that we could sneak out and then drink something and come back and have a clean urine test. And the next day, after my night of just on my knees, just crying and surrendering, I, she said, you know, hey, let's do this and that. And I'm like, you know what? I think I'm actually going to listen to what they're saying. I think I'm going to trust them. I think they might, the, the specialists here probably know what they're talking about. And my whole shift, my whole life shifted. And you're here now because I'm here of that. now, absolutely. Um, I want to talk more about your career as a paramedic. Mm -hmm. How did you decide to become a paramedic? Uh, so when I was young, my mom had a ruptured brain aneurysm. So that caused her to have seizures all the time from the injury. And we called 911 all the time. So paramedics would come. And at that time, I also had a five-year-old brother. And he would either hide behind the couch or hide in the bathroom. And because the paramedics came to our house so much, they knew that. So they would take care of my mom like they needed to. And then a lot of the times they would find my brother and make sure he was OK. And that was just so amazing to me. And I'm like, that I belong in that field. You want to help people? I want to help people like that. Um, some people say that paramedics are, attract, uh, are attracted to adrenaline rush. Mm. Is that true, or do you think that's misleading? I think we do like adrenaline, for mm -hmm. sure. I think we like the satisfaction more so like that the adrenaline brings. There's a combination. Yes, it's, it's not just like racing a car and getting the adrenaline. We have the adrenaline, and then we have the end result of being able to help someone. and, and save their lives even potentially so and, and uh, we've been talking about suicide I wanted to go uh, through some numbers of mm -hmm. um, suicide statistics for first responders and military mm -hmm. between 2014 and 2016 179 Canadian public safety and military personnel have died by suicide in 2014 between the months of April and December 27 first responders and 21 military personnel die by suicide in 2015, 51 first responders and 17 military personnel died. And in 2016, 48 first responders and 15 military personnel died by suicide. Is it hard to admit that you need help when you're a paramedic? It really is. Luckily, the culture is starting to change, but we have a ways to go. Uh, we're supposed to be the heroes, you know, it's a, it sounds cliche, but it's true. When we get to a scene, people are, you know, handing us their children. We're, we're strangers and we need to take care of them. And it's, we feel like, well, we must be strong in order to be able to deal with this. And, but the fact of the matter is we're still human. So we've been trained and we are amazing at taking care of whatever patient we get to, mm -hmm. but we have to be able to realize that uh, there's an effect that all of these calls are going to have on us. And speaking about it doesn't equal weakness. It's, that's what equals strength to me. Um, when you were first training to be a paramedic, mm -hmm. Did they, were you ever trained on how to deal with PTSD or even how to spot it? Nothing, no. So I graduated from college in 2003 and I think I learned about PTSD in my psychology class mm -hmm. and we spoke about it as a patient might have it. We never referred to it as that we might have it. Mm -hmm. And you've become an advocate for PTSD amongst first responders, yeah. and you've lobbied for this, uh, Bill 163, supporting Ontario's yeah. First Responders Act, which passed in April on April 5th, 2016. And it, it applies to more than 73,000 first responders in Ontario. It amends the Workplace Safety and Insurance Act so that PTSD diagnosis in first responders is immediately accepted as work-related. Mm -hmm. It also allows for the Minister of Labour to request and publish PTSD prevention plans from first responder organizations. Mm -hmm. How has this made a difference for people in your profession? It's made a tremendous difference. I've seen literally 
when the bill passed, I had a specific friend who was away as well in rehab, and he was already about to sell his assets. Um, he needed to afford his mortgage, and the bill passed, and his claim was approved, and he didn't need to do those things. He was, you know, on the brink of bankruptcy. And plus, you know, with taking away that desperate financial struggle, families have some more time to heal and take care of themselves. So there's still, we still have a ways to go and, and, and it's a great uh, beginning, but um, it, it, it saved lives 100%. Acknowledging, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you were getting treatment, you wrote in your book, when can I go back to work? Mm -hmm. When can I wear my uniform again? Why were you so eager to return to work? You know, I thought I would say to people, well, I'm a paramedic, it's my job, but it's not my identity. Mm -hmm. Well, I was very wrong. <laughs> and I literally had to go through the grieving process of my career when I realized that it wasn't healthy for me anymore. Mm -hmm. We, as first responders, we, it is part of our identity. We are a different culture of people that take so much pride in, in being able to affect human lives on such an extraordinary level. And having that opportunity removed so suddenly and not willingly uh, was devastating. You eventually went back to work. Yes. Um, how did everything work out? Not well. So I, I went back on the road, and I think it was about six shifts. And the spiral into my depression and the darkness was just almost overnight. And I wasn't even from a call. It wasn't even related to that. It was just being in the environment. Noise was still too much for me. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I relapsed. So I knew that was for sure uh, a signal that I was finished that part of my career. And by you, something else came out of it. Right. Um, you created something called Wings of Change. Yes. What is that? So Wings of Change is a peer support model. Uh, I've actually adapted it from Sid Gravel. So he's a retired staff sergeant mm -hmm. in the Ottawa Police and a member of the Order of Merit. So he wrote a book, 56 Seconds, and it describes his journey through PTSD. But in it, he also documents um, how he developed Robin's Blue Circle, which was a peer support group for police back then. And as you can imagine, starting a peer support group in the police world 25 years ago mm -hmm. was very difficult. The stigma was huge and you just didn't talk about your pain. But so and I, I took his model with his permission and his help and I got a focus group from different first responders across Canada and we adapted it and made Wings to Change. And it's a model that anyone can use to have a peer support meeting. It's all solution-based discussion and bringing your peers around, and it just makes the conversation so much easier. You've been through the 12-step program, mm -hmm. and you write, the 12-step meetings are just monotonous now. Sure, I learn things every time, but I tire of listening to the same preamble and stories. How do people do this for 40 years? I'm confused about my future, and at this point, I am exhausted from trying to figure it out. Um, was there a point where pure support was no longer useful for you? So, um, so that my opinion about the 12 step program has changed. That was still at a very um, negative time in my, re in my rehabilitation, but. How has uh, it changed? It's changed because I became open-minded to it. I was so close-minded. I didn't go in thinking that it could possibly help me. Mm -hmm. So now it, it does. It allows me to still have a fellowship and friends again that get it and that mm -hmm. peer support. That's a different set of peers, but. Um, Peer support has been 100% one of the main reasons why I recovered. Why were you pushing back before? I just was so stubborn. <laughs> you do write about your stubbornness. I was so, I, you know, and ego, you know, mm. and I thought I'm an advanced care paramedic and I know about addiction and I know about mm. these things and I needed to get knocked down a lot and, and believe mm -hmm. I was a human too. Yeah. You write that I will never be fully recovered. I will always be in recovery. Mm. That seems daunting. It does seem daunting until you accept that that is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. So without being in recovery every day and being mindful of the things that I need to do to stay healthy, then for sure I can slip backwards. Mm -hmm. So because recovery in the stage that I'm at is positive, it's okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a daily process. It's a daily job. Do you worry about relapsing? Yeah, of course. I, I've had bad days where, you know, my mind 
wants to lie to me and it wants to trick me into using things that I used to use to numb. But it's so few and far between now. And then I'll use my coping skills that I've learned through Save My Life School mm -hmm. and Homewood to be able to move past it and move through it properly. And, and you're teaching now? Yeah, so yeah. I teach, um, I will be teaching the introduction to addiction program at Simon Fraser University online, and that starts soon with mm -hmm. amazing trauma program that's the first of its kind, which is great. And it's interesting that I'm the person that's teaching it because I'm not an addiction counselor, but we teach first responders, well, how do we, what is addiction? Mm -hmm. And how do we um, treat these patients with compassion mm -hmm. and treat them as human beings? You have a lot of passions. Uh, you have the book, the peer group work, uh, the teaching and the anti-stigma work that you're doing for mental health. Mm -hmm. But you also have another passion which you literally wear on your sleeve. Oh, yes. Can you please show us your tattoo? Sure. What's the story behind it? Um, do you want me to take this Well, off? I can just see just this part, here? yeah. Well, yeah, it's a big story. So I, I started this process, it goes up to here, um, right at the beginning of Save My Life School. Mm -hmm. And it's a combination of uh, stages of my recovery. So here I have a picture of Mary, which so shows my spiritual side, not necessarily my religious side. And then um, the butterflies and the moths. And um, I also have the one of the best parts is that I have a is that a ladybug, know, a ladybug, <laughs> and that is in memory of my friend who died by suicide in 2014. So yeah, and it's still growing. It's growing. <laughs> Congratulations for being so courageous and for writing this book. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. And to think that one day you might not have been here. Absolutely. You know, it's very affirming. Thank you. Thanks. It's my pleasure. Thanks, Natalie. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.